Hello once again. Today we're taking a look at perhaps one of the most unique vintage computers I've ever owned. It's a Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100 made in the mid-1980s. Now, in the uh, sake of transparency, I am not going to go in depth into this uh, thing today in this video because I bought this around Christmas time as sort of an impulse buy and I ended up never really using it. Uh, for years I thought I wanted one of these and would do you know a lot of cool and fun stuff with it and now that I actually have one, I actually just haven't used it at all. I poked around with it a little bit the first couple of months I had it. And then I never really touched it again. Which is a little sad. But that's just the way it goes these days, I guess. Um, so I'm making this video basically to get it out of the way. Because this thing is going to a new owner. I am sending this computer along with a couple of other things to Evangeline Dominic, uh, viewer and friend of the channel, who you've seen mentioned in a couple of previous videos because she has sent me not one but two packages of cool vintage electronic stuff, um, which I have yet to make videos of any of that, which I'm really ashamed of. Um, but she sent me a ton of cool stuff, and she's actually wanted one of these too. So I'm like, you know what? I'll just send her this. And uh, hopefully she can make more use, get more enjoyment out of it um, than I've been able to. So that's what I'm going to do. So I bought this thing on eBay. I paid about $130 for it. And I bought it as working, but some of the keyboard keys... Uh, didn't work and indeed four or five random keyboard keys were totally unresponsive. I was able to fix that. It's an issue that occasionally crops up on these computers and it's very easily fixed. It's just It was just a broken trace on the keyboard PCB. You wouldn't think, you know, th because the keys were very random. It wasn't like one vertical row or four horizontal keys in a row. It was four extremely random keys that were knocked out by one broken trace. And I was able to fix that. I just soldered a bodge wire uh, across the, from one from point A to B. And uh, yeah, it was very easy to determine. I basically took a multimeter, put it across one of the key switches itself to make sure the key switch itself was actually good, and then just traced each solder pad from the key, found out that one of the two traces uh, was the faulty trace. And when I fixed that one trace, it brought all the four, uh, four or five dead keys back. So that's nice. So yeah, after my repair, this thing works perfectly. I didn't have to do anything else to it, which is great. Uh, sometimes you come across these and they have a bad display like there's lines or columns missing in the display um, and that's a bit more of a severe issue um, it's been a while since I did all the reading about that but I think that's an issue that uh, uh, is difficult if not impossible to fix but luckily this thing has a perfectly fine display so this is kind of a neat and historical machine uh, Radio Shack sold this computer from 1983 to 1991 or 92. And this was actually made by Kyocera in Japan. Uh, it started life as the Kyocera Kyotronic 85, sold only in Japan, and it was not popular. But Radio Shack uh, saw the Kyotronic 85. And they were like, hey, we could sell this. And so what Radio Shack did was they took the Keotronic 85, had their own firmware for it designed by Microsoft, of all people, and they sold it as, in their own words, a micro-executive workstation, a portable computer 
for the business person or for business use in general, uh, a portable workstation. And this thing turned out to be really, really popular. Um, funny enough, its killer user turned out not quite to be businesses, but to be journalists. Journalists ate this thing up. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, this thing has a full-size keyboard, and it's a wonderful keyboard to type on. It's nothing spectacular. It's a pretty ho-hum keyboard, but it feels just fine, and it's full-size, and you can type really well on it. Second of all, this thing came with either 8 kilobytes or 24 kilobytes of memory. Plenty of space to do a lot of writing, a lot of word processing on something like this. And uh, word processing is one of the built-in applications that came with this computer. This computer came with a few built-in applications that were written by Microsoft. And then the final thing is, this thing has a built-in modem. And that made this thing the killer machine for the journalist on the go because you could gather your information and write your story while you're out and about. And then when you had a chance to get to a telephone, either in a hotel or if you had an acoustic coupler, because Radio Shack sold an acoustic coupler for this thing, you could use that and dial back to the office even over a payphone and then use the built-in 300 baud modem to transfer your written story back to headquarters or whatever you want to call it. That was pretty darn cool and so journalists became the primary market for this computer. But as a general purpose computer it's limited but there's still a lot you can do. And there is a huge enthusiast community today built around these computers. Not only the Model 100, but a sister model that uh, Radio Shack came out with a year or two later, the Model 200, which was basically the same computer in a laptop form factor with a larger uh, display, a taller display. And uh, yeah, there's a huge and very vibrant enthusiast community made around these. People have made, not, not only are there like hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, basic programs that you can look up online and either type in or transfer into the machine. But people have made hardware upgrades too. The 8K of RAM is extremely limiting because after the ROM is loaded into RAM, the ROM remains resident in RAM and it's backed up by the battery power, you only really have 4K of memory to work with to store programs in. So the 24K version of this is really much more useful. Well, people have made homebrew 24K upgrades. In fact, people have made a homebrew uh, daughter board that installs into the expansion slot, which is under this door, that not only gives you 24 kilobytes of memory, but it gives you something like a megabyte of flash storage. And you can, from the machine itself, uh, go into the flash storage and select a 24 kilobyte page to load into the 24 kilobytes of memory. And, and so it's really cool. People have designed and come out with all of these upgrades that make this a far more powerful computer than Radio Shack ever imagined it would be. It's really cool. And they cost a bit of money, but they're really cool. Radio Shack were not the only people to take the Keotronic 85. Uh, NEC had their own version of the Keotronic 85. It was called the NEC PC8201. And they also later came out with the PC8300, which had some hardware upgrades. Olivetti had their own version called the M10. And in 1986 or 7, Radio Shack actually replaced this with an upgraded version simply called the Tandy 102, no longer bearing the TRS-80 name or the Radio Shack name. Um, but it was much slimmer in a slimmer case, much lighter, and it came standard with 24K of memory.
and it replaced a lot of the internal circuitry with surface mount circuitry. So it's probably the Tandy 102 is probably a lot more reliable too. There were a lot of accessories sold for this. Uh, there was the aforementioned uh, acoustic coupler for the modem. There was also a floppy disk drive sold for this that stored, are you ready, 100 kilobytes on a double density three and a half inch floppy disk. Although very forward thinking that they used three and a half inch disks. And that floppy drive was basically a rebranded Brother floppy drive that Brother made for their sewing machines, their programmable sewing machines. And oddly enough, the original accessory for this thing was a barcode reader. This thing has a dedicated barcode reader port on it. It's basically a receive-only serial port, and another one of the pins uh, has VCC on it to power the barcode reader. And uh, yeah, that was like the initial one accessory that Radio Shack sold for this thing, a barcode reader, which is kind of funny. But looking at the unit in more detail here, here's your LCD display. It is a 40 column by 8 line display. Graphically it's 240 by 64 pixels, I think. And it's a marginal quality display. It's good enough. You have a row of function keys here. Here's your arrow keys, not a very intuitive design. NEC's version of this computer uh, had an actual, you know, directional pad for the arrow keys, which is much nicer. You have this full-size keyboard, which is very excellent to type on. Some of the keys actually mechanically latch, like they would on a typewriter. You get a red LED that lights up when your batteries are starting to get low. Battery life on this was advertised, it, it takes four AA batteries, it was advertised as being able to run the unit for 20 hours or have it turned off in standby for a month. That's pretty darn good, but also that was on 1983 batteries and today those times are so much longer. I don't know how long, but what I can tell you is I bought this thing eight, nine, ten months ago and the batteries that the seller shipped inside it are the batteries I'm still using. So standby time on modern batteries is not a month, but more like a year. <laughs> just, that just shows how much batteries have improved. Go around the left side here. We have controls for the built-in 300 baud modem. So it's not, it's not a haze compatible modem. It's not an intelligent modem. It's very, very rudimentary modem. It's basically an acoustic modem, but, you know, direct connect rather than actually being acoustic. But, uh, for example, this switch on the right here says answer or originate. On the very earliest, very dumbest modems, you have to physically set whether you are the calling party or the called party because the Bell 103 standard has carrier tones of different frequencies depending on if you're the calling party or the called party. The calling party is what they call the originating party. And then this other switch here, DIR or ACP, that selects whether you are directly connecting the unit's modem to the telephone line or if you are going through an acoustic coupler. That's your barcode reader port, not usable as a standard serial port. Go around the back. You have two DIN jacks here, one for the modem and a cassette jack. And then the cassette port, I think, is the same as used on other TRS-80 computers, um, but it's got pins for uh, data input, so from the output of your cassette recorder, data output, so through into the line input of your cassette recorder, and remote pins to automatically start and stop the cassette recorder. I built a cable to use this cassette port. I'll demonstrate transferring data to and from a cassette recorder. So yeah, actually I was able to find uh, the right DIN plug on DigiKey and I went ahead and built my own uh, cable for probably 15 bucks in parts. And then I wanted to build a cable 
to use the built-in modem, uh, but this DIN plug is different and I can't find the right type. So yeah, uh, whenever I've tried this thing, uh, connecting this thing to a remote computer, I just use the serial port, which is right here, and I use my, uh, my own modem. And there's the parallel printer port, a non-standard port. Your serial port is a standard RS-232 port, but you can see it's female, whereas on uh, a PC, it would be male. I don't know if other TRS-80s used a female port, but anyway, all you need is a gender changer adapter to make that male. And a gender changer is pretty much necessary anyway because the serial port's kind of recessed into the case and a lot of plugs don't uh, fit in correctly uh, without a gender changer being inserted first. So, a bit of a little design fluke on their part. And then go around the other side. We can run this thing off a 6 volt DC adapter if we want. And we have a contrast dial for the display and our on off switch. Oh, one thing I missed. Uh, right there in that little recessed part, which you probably won't be able to see, but that is a reset switch. It's just a soft reset. It doesn't erase the memory or anything. Um, but if the computer locks up, you can use that to get things working again. I've had to do that once before. It was today, <laughs> preparing for this video, oddly enough. There's your four AA batteries. There's your expansion slot under there. Where you could plug in an expansion not only for the RAM, but you could also plug ROM cartridges in here. Radio Shack sold software for this uh, in the form of ROM cards that you could plug in and give you the extra programs. That's nice. And there we go, Radio Shack model 26-3801, 6 volt DC, 1.1 watts. Custom manufactured in Japan. And that is your memory power switch. That is to be turned on all the time. If you turn it off, it cuts the batteries off from the memory and the memory is erased. And all four rubber feet are still present and in good shape, which is nice. I did get this with the manual. And it's a wonderful manual. Nice, nicely bound, thick paper, and very, very detailed. Lots of nice, lovely diagrams. And it's so detailed that it gives you pinouts for all the ports, even the barcode reader. Radio Shack were very, very open about allowing developers and other uh, power user types to really dig into this thing. Look at that, pinouts for the... Uh... Ah, yeah, so some of the pins on the... Uh modem plug R4 acoustic coupler. That's why it's a uh, DIN plug and not just an RJ11 jack. The built-in 300 baud modem on this thing is so basic that uh, it's not even tone dial. It's pulse dial only. And so if you were using one of these today and had it directly connected to the phone line and your phone line only supports tone dialing like a lot of uh, VoIP ATAs are, mine supports pulse dialing luckily, but a lot of them don't, uh, you would have to have a telephone also plug into the line, dial the number with the telephone, and then put this thing out on the line. All right, let's turn this thing on. Very uneventful boot up. Tells you how much memory you've got free. Wow, only 3.2 kilobytes. Gives you the date, it's not Y2K compliant. And that is actually the correct date, or the correct time. Well, it's an hour off, actually, because daylight savings time has switched since I originally bought this thing, but it's only running four minutes fast. Wow, all the time I've had this on the same set of batteries, and it's kept the time that well. And there you can see copyright Microsoft. Uh, kind of a cool factoid about this thing. Bill Gates himself wrote the majority of this thing's ROM. Uh, and in fact, it was the last software product that he ever coded himself. The TRS-80 Model 100 was the last project that Bill Gates himself ever worked on as a programmer. That's pretty darn cool. So, 
on the main menu here you can see the built-in applications we have we have our basic program composer we have our word processing text we have our terminal emulator telecom we have an address book we have a scheduler and I wrote not wrote I typed in a blackjack program that I found online which actually worked really well and was fun to play but uh, now when I try to run it um, it uh, gives me an error I must have accidentally typed something or something like that accidentally pressed a button or something but it won't run anymore we'll go into basic here uh, run because it's already in memory and then there's an error in line two so uh, I'm not, anyway I can't be bothered to try and fix that to demonstrate in this video that's okay F8 gets you back into the main menu go into our text composer here uh, makes you create a file name test and uh, yeah this keyboard is just uh, wonderful it's very nice to type on and there you can see it just uh, saved our file there the scheduler is nothing fancy it's pretty much just uh, actually I've never even used it but it's so basic that it doesn't like do reminders or anything like that Radio Shack wanted this thing to have a alarm feature uh, where the unit, because it's got a built-in beeper, as you've just heard, um, Radio Shack really wanted this thing to be able to have an alarm go off even when the machine is turned off. But Kyocera could not fit it in the available ROM space, <laughs> so they omitted it. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, we go into basic here. And I can do the stereotypical 10 print. It's, it's just Microsoft Basic. It works like every other Microsoft Basic on a million other uh, computers. Run. And there it goes. Shift pause to break. And we're out. This thing has an Okidata 80C85 microprocessor running at, I think, 2.1 MHz. That's an Intel 8085 clone, a low-power clone. So, yeah, I mean, in 1983, that wasn't anything to sneeze at. I mean, yes, 16-bit computers based on the 8086 and 8088 were out, but there were still a ton of computers, a ton of, like, full-size desktop AC-powered microcomputers powered by less powerful CPUs than this thing has, which was pretty, uh, you know, this thing was pretty powerful at the time, as far as 8-bit machines go. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, I'll demonstrate one more thing. Let me grab one of my modems and hook it up to a telephone line, and we'll use this thing to dial into a BBS. Back when I got this thing, that's what I thought I would use it most for, was as a cool, portable terminal to dial into BBSs with. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work out that well for it because it's only a 40 column display. And there are a few BBSs designed to work well with 40 columns, but the majority want 80 columns. And with a 40 column display, I can't even properly configure my serial modems because the, the interface built into my serial modems for programming them and setting registers and stuff, they were designed around an 80 column terminal. So, and everything just gets all messed up looking when you try to read that stuff on a 40 column display. So it really doesn't work that well. But uh, let me fetch some stuff. Oh, I got to demonstrate uh, using a cassette drive. So actually first, let me do that. And we'll, uh, we'll take a look at using a cassette drive. Helping us with this demonstration is a relic from a video from a few years ago. The Sony Tape Recorder Model TC-110A Cassette Recorder from 1973. 
And this is the cable I built when I first got this thing. Everything came from DigiKey. Got the DIN plug and three separate cables. Output, input, and remote. This cassette recorder does have a remote jack, but I found out it doesn't work. <laughs> so we won't be using that. But that's fine, you don't need that. And uh, I recall having a bit of difficulty shoving three different leads into this one plug. I had to cut the uh, strain relief off to get everything to fit. But it friggin' works. Plug into our cassette port. Just like that. And the lead that I labeled Mike goes into the line in jack. And the other one goes into the headphone output. We'll stick in our cassette. I'll advance it up to the uh, leader. Or pass the leader, rather. There we go. And uh, we'll turn the unit on here. And we have our Hello World program I saved as test. So we'll go into basic. And the command to save something to the cassette drive is C save. Oops. And then a file name. So I'll just call it test. And it'll begin as soon as I hit enter. So I'm going to start our recording and hit enter. And you can see by the level meter. And it's done. Heard a relay click in the computer, says OK, we'll stop our recording. And we'll back that up to where it started, which was about right there. And actually first, I'll let you hear what uh, the data sounds like. That's it, I'm pretty sure. There's actually two different formats you can save data in. Uh, what you just heard is the normal format, which is compressed, but you can also save in an ASCII format, which uses a little more tape, but I suspect it's more reliable. And reliability can be an issue with using a cassette drive, uh, especially if your uh, cassette recorder is 48 years old and perhaps isn't in the best of mechanical or electronic condition anymore. But I have had very good luck with this. So we'll back the tape up again. And to load the program, we use C load. And a relay clicked, and we can hit play. And the, so the sound will actually come out of the unit speaker. And it found it. Done. Easy as that. And if I do a list, there's our program. Successfully recorded to and played back from cassette. Very cool. Uh, you can obviously do this with a digital uh, recorder. It is probably much more reliable, but hey, you got a 48 year old cassette recorder. Hell yeah, I'm gonna use my 48 year old cassette recorder. So there you go. That's a demonstration of the cassette drive and Ava will get this cable as well. So now, uh, let me grab a modem and get that all set up and we'll demonstrate using this thing to dial into a BBS. All right, we've got a modem hooked up to our telephone line, serial cable connected to the computer. So we'll turn the machine on here and we're gonna go into the telecom program and the BBS we're actually gonna be dialing into actually runs at 300 baud, so it would actually be perfect uh, for dialing into it using the machine's built-in modem. 
but uh, I've set the serial port speed to 300 baud, so my modem is forced down to 300 baud. Serial port on this thing supports up to 19.2k, I think. Although when you're on a BBS, the machine is actually not capable of uh, rendering text faster than like 2400 baud, if that. Um, but anyway, I'm going to press F4 to go into terminal mode. And if I do an AT, we are connected to our modem. So, let's dial into the backyard board, which is the BBS I've chosen, because it's 40 column compatible. So we're going to go ATDT 905895-5904. That's it. We're connected. Press return. And there we go. We're dialed into a BBS on a Model 100. Oh, bit of a glitch there. And the line just hung up. Wow. <laughs> Not a very good connection. Uh, let me try that again. Oh wow, straight up disconnect. I wonder if I'm getting voluntarily kicked off. Huh, okay, not a good connection. <laughs> Let me see if I can find another BBS. Okay, let's try another board. This one's called Amos XE. It's for Atari users. And uh, this one actually has a faster modem, so I've sped the serial port back up. 9493259040. There we go, and the username and password is this. Oh, another hang up! Oh, what's going on? Oh, I'm having really. It's a really bad night for modeming, apparently. Sorry, someone else is using the. <laughs> I didn't even get the rest of it. Uh, wow, they must be all full up. That's. That's an uncommon uh, occurrence on BBSs these days. Here's another board meant for Atari users, so I assume it's 40 column compatible. A lot of Atari specific BBSs. 503-245-5416. Wow. I don't know if there's something wrong with my line or not. I, uh, I don't know. 
Huh. I forced it down to uh, 300 baud again. Let's try that. There we go. We're at 9600 baht apparently. That must be the uh, answering computers. That must be the answering modem's connection to the computer or something. We'll go standard ASCII. <laughs> that seems to be working pretty well. Well, I'm not going to go through putting in information that BBS sysops have no business asking for in the 21st century. But anyway, you saw this thing work. Dialed into a few BBSs and that was my, that was what I thought I would use this thing for was, you know, dialing, using it as a cool portable terminal. Except uh, I learned that 40 columns it severely limits you. Well that is about all there is to show of the Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100 portable computer from 1983. What a neat little unit! Uh, it's no wonder that these things have such a enthusiast community around them. They are really cool little computers! And there's a lot you can do with them. Basic programming, I forgot to mention this earlier, but you can also uh, write uh, assembly language programs for these. And the uh, built-in telecom program is pretty neat and uh, with the full-size keyboard it's a nice writing machine the original killer app for this thing for journalists on the go it's a neat little computer I'm just a little sad that I bought this one thinking I would end up having a lot of fun with it and I just ended up never using it at all but I'm really happy that I'm gonna be sending this one to Evangeline Dominic she has sent me two packages of so much cool stuff that I need to get to and make videos of. And uh, uh, it is absolutely, I, I am more than happy to give this to her. And hopefully she can uh, have some fun with it. And she said she might make a video, either a video of unboxing this or a video of playing around with it and or. Uh, so you may wish to subscribe to our channel if you want to potentially see more of this thing in the future. But for me, uh, I'm glad it's going to go to someone who's going to hopefully uh, have more fun with it than I have. And a little dub I'm making during the edit here. I just remembered that there's actually a NICAD battery built into these. It's used to hold the memory alive for a few minutes while you're changing the main batteries. And it's one of those Varda style NICAD batteries that always leak. And uh, I actually replaced the battery in this one. Luckily it was only just starting to leak. But I actually replaced it with a 5.5 volt 1.5 farad supercapacitor. So that should be able to serve the same purpose. Just as well if not better. And uh, yeah so Ava's gonna have a really good turnkey machine that should be problem free for her for hopefully years to come. Who knows maybe in the future I'll buy another one of these maybe I'll find a cheap one on eBay that once again has a messed up keyboard and I'll be able to fix that and maybe I'll have another one of these. But until then uh, there's a look at this thing I hope you guys have enjoyed taking a look at a cool early portable computer. Thank you so much for watching. A big thanks to my Patreon supporters. 
their support is what helps me afford to get things like this and show them on video. And uh, so I gotta give a shout out to them. They really help a lot. So until next time, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you later.